almost everything in our modern society, commerce, industry, warfare, healthcare, education, has been shaped by our understanding of science and technology. In this video, I'll go over what physics is, why mathematics is the language of physics, and four of the main branches of it. So Wikipedia tells us that physics is the natural science that studies matter, its fundamental constituents, its motion and behavior through space and time, and the re related entities of energy and force. Physics is the fundamental science. It is a science that studies everything in the universe. If it exists, it falls within the realm of study of physics, and there's nothing outside of the scope of its field. Physics attempts to explain everything down to the first principle, meaning try to get to the most granular level of understanding possible of a given phenomenon. So in short, everything that we can see, feel, touch, and taste it falls within the study of physics. But that's not to say that physics is the most important science. Knowledge is useless if you can't apply it. That's why we have the other sciences and technology. We need other fields of study to take this fundamental knowledge and use it as something actionable, to translate it into things that we can use to better our day-to-day -day circumstance. Besides, physics will tell you when the soil is hot, but not when to plant. Physics will tell you how two molecules interact, but won't tell you what molecules you need to make a treatment or a medicine. Physics can tell us how atoms behave, but it won't directly tell us how to ferment grain into making the beer that society needs to operate. A society needs all types of people. If society was just scientists and phys physicists, it would be a very boring society. That's why you need engineers, chefs, logistical and maintenance personnel, artists, communicators, leaders, so on and so forth, so society can run because it takes all types. And you can't just have one way of thinking because you never know when you're going to be in the, in the wrong. Everything in the universe is subject to the laws of physics, and there's nothing in the universe that's outside the scope of the science. Physics relies on the scientific method, using it to put forth hypothesis, collect data, and then, op and then update its hypothesis. The, the scientific method also helps us organize and communicate our data so that we can pass it forth and have other people review and analyze our data. Science doesn't seek to make statements about what is correct or incorrect. It simply tries to study the universe and then make rules that will predict its future behavior. So physics is the creation of models that we can use to predict future behavior of phenomena in nature. Physics doesn't seek to tell the universe how it operates. It simply seeks to describe it and understand it so that we can have, so we can take this information and then use it for something useful. Physics has a unique position in our society. A, a country's or society level of technological development will affect everything from industry, logistics, medicine, education, agriculture, and so forth. And having a mastery of sciences might be one of the defining factors in a nation's success in competition or in its development of its resources or forwarding of its education. In my opinion, physics still has a very odd position in society because we, we are so dependent on our technologies from everyday life, from the internet, transportation, cars, satellites, and so forth. And that's not even going into like medical or agricultural technologies that we depend on for food and medicine. The fate of empires and societies have pivoted on their ability to learn and grow. In ancient times, the having the understanding of how to make and how to forge iron as opposed to copper weapons might have been the defining factor if an empire or society was able to exist and survive. A more recent example would be the Asia Pacific Theater in World War II, which ended when the United States completed the most expensive scientific project ever, the Manhattan Project. So it's easy to make the argument that physics was instrumental in helping accelerate the end of the war in the Pacific. Physics is like art and religion. It is one of the most quintessential and fundamental parts of the human experience. Physics is derived from the same human experience and sentiment that is to look around and want to understand the world around you, to be curious, to want to learn how things work, to poke at things and see what happens. Um, the same sentiment that I think uh, someone in a religious experience or an artist draws upon that sense of awe of the world that we live in, that you want to look at everything, take it in, understand it, is the same sentiment that drives a lot of scientists to want to, to go into their fields. In the United States, the U.S. federal government places a very heavy emphasis 
on ensuring the continued scientific development of the United States society. The federal government, through different agencies for different fields, such as the National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, uh, spends a lot of money on its universities and national uh, laboratories. The United States is known globally for its postgraduate facilities. The United States has some of the best finance uh, university research labs that faculty and students have access to. This provides students a, an opportunity to get exposed to advanced technologies, expensive scientific equipment, and develop skills that they would then need moving forward in either research and academics or in the private industry. The federal government heavily subsidizes um, the education of scientists. In my experience, and I could be wrong here with the changing times, um, if you attempt to go for a master's or a PhD in chemistry or physics, you more than likely will not have to pay tuition. The federal government will give you a stipend to give you the basics of living costs and tuition so you can focus on your studies and develop as a scientist. The federal government will always want to have a very large pool of trained and available scientists and engineers for different projects, be it infrastructure, civilian development, or in case of a crisis, uh, maybe a war or some other circumstance like the impending climate catastrophe to consult and to draw from their scientific experience to make better informed decisions. So in the end, having a developed scientific community, having well-equipped research labs that have equipment and personnel that are competent in their trades on it is extremely important for society. These, un these universities will then provide uh, college graduates that can then go on to work in, in industry, having an understanding of very advanced equipment and scientific principle. And that's something very important for high tech industry and for different government ventures like aerospace, NASA, um, and also military research and defense. Before moving on to why we use mathematics, I wanted to give you a quick background as to who I am and a little bit of my journey through physics. I grew up in what some would lovingly call a shithole country. Uh, I did have access to American media, so American video games, TVs, movies. I remember growing up watching the Ninja Turtles, uh, Don Tello, specifically the scientist of the group, uh, playing as Gordon Freeman in Half-Life, who was a theoretical physicist, watching movies of advanced laboratories up in the global north in the developed nations where people carried out cutting edge research. I was mesmerized by the idea of these developed industrialized nations where they had massive cities with subways and skyscrapers. These countries where they had these extremely well-funded scientific institutes. And I love puzzles. I like the idea of building things, of learning how to make things more efficient, and finding out how elegant the behavior of the different interacting parts of the universe that makes reality as we know it operate the extremely high level engineering, the precision in all our consumer goods, the level of understanding that we have to have of the physical universe and phenomenon to be able to make computers, self-driving electric cars, airplanes, jets, going back to the moon, hopefully in, in the near future, along with all the other technological consumer goods that we have nowadays. As I got older, um, I got my opportunity to go up north and live in the United States where I was able to get my bachelor's of physics uh, once I graduated, because I didn't want to enter the workforce, I didn't know what to do, and I didn't have work authorization, I ended up getting my master's in physics. Initially, I was going for a PhD, but life happens. Sometimes you, sometimes your plans change, and what you thought was best for you may not be best for you anymore. Grad school was where I got my initial experience with equipment, so I was in charge of operating uh, thin film deposition chambers, specifically magnetron sputtering, e-beam evaporation. I also was able to work a lot with scanning electron microscopes, telling electron microscopes, and a variety of magnetometers as well. All this experience with equipment, plus a couple of publications, is what was able to get me a job in the tech industry, where I worked as an engineer. So I kind of was one of those scientists that sold out, never got my PhD. Academic physics, there's a tendency to want to push students to go get a PhD and then teach academically. Uh, in my opinion, there is an oversupply of PhDs, so somebody has to go to industry. 
And after a lot of years, I was ready to drop out from school and just do something different and get paid better. <laughs> so personally, I did want to give a quick shout out to the National Science Foundation. I went to a public university, which was subsidized by the state and the federal government. And then the National Science Foundation financed the three years that I was in my master's program. Personally, I'm very grateful for the federal government investing so much money in me, and I'm currently happy to be paying it back in taxes. Is that the United States is actually the global leader in technology by a mile. American universities are very well known for funding and for having a very large amount of international students come to the United States for grad school. Uh, American universities will, and American science and engineering programs have very high levels of funding, very high levels of equipment, access to facilities and personnel, and depending on where you are, also access to industry. So sometimes I feel that it's not recognized the amount of success the United States has had in developing its academic scientific community. Anyway, I just want to take a second to point out one positive aspect in the world just filled with bad news is that uh, the United States and the investment over the years has grown a very well-developed and capable postgraduate scientific community in American universities. American education in physics and chemistry, especially when, when it comes to anything that has equipment, is top-notch global level. Mathematics and physics and science as a whole go hand in hand in this presentation in the media. Anytime that you can see a scientific character in a movie, TV show, comic book, so forth, usually you can let the audience know that this character is scientifically literate by having them do mathematics, usually. So think of all those times you see a character or a professor at a university with a board filled, filled with different mathematical equations something that the character will walk back and forth of while trying to debate some equation or some mathematical problem that they're trying to work on or figure out. There, and there's a very good reason for this. Mathematics is the language of physics. Physics cannot be done without mathematics. The Wikipedia definition of mathematics is an area of knowledge that includes such topics as numbers, arithmetic and number theory, formulas, and related structures, algebra shapes and spaces in which they are contained, geometry and their qualities and their, and quantities and their changes, calculus and analysis. So why does physics have to go hand in hand with mathematics? Because mathematics is the, the language in which physicists will review and debate phenomenon. So why mathematics? There's two main reasons, universality and exactness. Let's start with universality. Mathematics and its laws will be as true to you as they are to me. Doesn't matter if your age, my age, how long it's been since I recorded this and you're hearing it, where you are, where I am, our national, ethnic, religious, so on and so forth background. Physics has to be the same to everybody. So mathematics allows for that. The laws of mathematics will allow you to arrive at the same derivation or the same solution as me, regardless of all the factors I mentioned before. So mathematics is a vehicle to allow the message, the descriptions, the data to be transmitted with no distortion. Exactness refers to the ability to communicate something exactly. If I tell you that person walked fast, the definition of what fast is, is it five miles an hour? Is it six miles an hour? Is it eight kilometers an hour? That will vary based on your experience, your perspective, your opinion, my location, how I felt that day, and so many other factors. There's so much ambiguity in the transmission of information from me to you. So I'm not sure that as the speaker, you got the message I intended you to get. So mathematics helps us avoid this, making sure that the message that the recipient receives is what the sender intended to say. If I say that somebody walked at 5.2 miles per hour that is unambiguous that the definition of what that means uh its interpretation cannot change based on who is listening to it it's exactly 5.2 miles an hour if someone says that the speed of light is c equals three times 10 to the eighth oh that's an approximation but let's let's play along with this analogy that value is as true and universal here on the far side of the earth on the dark side of the moon now, a thousand years from now, a thousand years before. 
So why mathematics? Because it allows us to have a universal audience and transmit a message, an idea, or a data set exactly with no distortion based on the conditions of the message or the recipient. Mathematics presents physicists the tools they need. What's all that stuff you're grabbing? Tools! Tools! <laughs> Duct tape, zip ties, and gloves! I have to have my tools! To describe, analyze the, the universe. Qualities allow us to see how different variables relate to each other. Calculus and partial differential equations tells us how behaviors change with respect to each other or re with respect to other variables like space and time. Linear algebra gives us the framework that we need to work in higher dimensionality that, for, that we would need in, say, quantum mechanics or be able to do three-dimensional three space calculations such as tensors and stress mechanics. Einstein notation, Riemann sums, bracket notation, matrix operations all give us the tools that we need to describe and communicate behavior or phenomenon. These mathematical tools also allow us to describe systems and then to twist it around, to play with it, to find different ways to look at it, to solve for different variables. And this can lead us to be able to derive insight that we didn't have before or get a greater understanding of a system that might be useful in making some predictions or upgrades or changes or for planning reasons on a technical or industrial enterprise. And one of the focuses I've had talking about the purpose of the scientific method and physics and mathematics is it's the ability for me to transmit what I saw, describe, analyze, or found and take that information and transmit it to you with no errors. Science inherently has to be tackled in as a group. So it's very important for the different members of that group to be able to communicate effectively, especially the technical details of what they're working on. So science, technology, and research is a relay race where one generation of people passes on the baton to the next generation, so on and so forth for hundreds up to thousands of years. And that's, something, and that's something that I liked about studying science, is that you are participating in one of the oldest human enterprises. Everything that you inherit is communal human heritage. It's, our, the, it's the sum of our knowledge that has been built in by all parts of our civilization over the time period that we existed, the five, seven thousand years since we settled down and domesticated agriculture. There is no American physics, there's no Chinese mathematics, there's no Russian chemistry. It's all human science. And more importantly, it's just like art and culture, it's part of our collective heritage. Okay, so quick review. Mathematics is the language of science and technology because of its exactness and because of its universality. Mathematics gives us a framework to understand, analyze, to break apart and communicate the, any phenomenon that we're studying or that we're observing. Also, a note on the mathematics used in physics, um, after a certain point, mathematics is conducted almost in, exclusively in representation, using Greek characters to represent values. So, after a certain level, everything you're doing is in Greek, and you're not using numbers, you're, and that's what you're, how you're solving for um, your solutions or the variables that you're working towards. So well, now let's talk about the actual branches of physics that I talked about at the beginning of this video. We'll be going over four different branches of physics. So classical mechanics, electromagnetic wave theory, quantum, and relativity. These four represent a very spread out uh, collection of the different fields of physics. It's also the fields that anybody that's gone through the undergraduate degree process will have a degree of literacy in. Although this is one classification of the different branches of physics, there's a lot of other ones with more specificity broken down into more granular parts. I'll be showing some on screen now, so you can see that we have optics, thermodynamics, and so forth. But for, just for the sake of simplicity, I'll just be sticking to the four big ones in this video. Broadly speaking, the differences in these four fields is speed and size. So first we'll be starting off with classical mechanics that is large objects moving slowly. So when we talk about size, it's relative to an electron. So pretty much anything macroscopic will fall into classical mechanics. When we talk about speed, we mean speed relative to the speed of light. Most objects that we see are no traveling nowhere near the speed of light within our frame of reference. Is there anyone out there who wants to go fast? Anybody? I want to go fast. 
if something is approaching the speed of light, then you would need relativity. I would not be covering quantum field theory because I don't know anything about that. You will have to talk to someone that stayed in school longer than me to learn about that. They asked me how well I understood theoretical physics. I said I had a theoretical degree in physics. They said welcome aboard. Okay, so starting off, classical mechanics. Usually this is everybody's first experience of physics. The first time you study physics, uh, be it in college or high school, generally the first type of problems you'll get are basic ballistic trajectory or mechanics problems. So think um, a train is traveling east at such a speed, you throw a ball through, it, through the air, where does it fall, uh, bodies in, in free fall, what is the stress on a given point due to a load, all of that falls into classical mechanics. Some of the traditional examples of what you would see covered by classical mechanics is anything that has to do with speed, velocity, distance traveled over time, uh, stress. So you see this a lot in civil engineering, uh, ballistics, kinematics, anything that's movement of large objects, large again being macroscopic objects, or anything much larger than the electron or subatomic particle. Classical mechanics was developed over a millennium uh, through engineering and technology. And alongside this, we have algebra, which is a cornerstone for our study of classical mechanics. Note, algebra is not a Western word. I believe it's Arabic. And similarly, we use Arabic numerals. A big moment of development for classical mechanics is when Isaac Newton developed calculus. Calculus is an advanced mathematical tool that was needed to better understand the orbits of celestial bodies in space. Isaac Newton developed the three laws of motion. The first is everybody continues in a state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line unless it's compelled to change that state by forces impressed upon it. So things that are still, stay, in, stay still. Things in motion, stay in motion unless something acts upon them. Newton's second law says that the change of motion of an object is proportional of, to the force impressed and is made in the direction of a straight line in which the force is impressed. This is often represented as F equals MA and is one of the first things that you would learn in classical mechanics. So that means that force equals the mass times the acceleration. Anytime you have any two of the variables, you can always solve for the third. Newton's, Newton's third law is to every action, there is always an opposite and equal reaction or the mutual actions of two bodies upon each other are always equal and directed in contrary parts. So this is really big in uh, civil engineering construction. Newton's third law is what we use to calculate stress and strain on objects. So it's something that you need to calculate uh, load and stress on different materials and parts of construction or building. Another important part of classical mechanics is the relationship of work and energy. The work energy theorem tells us that the change in the state of an of a system is proportional to the force applied to the system. And this basically leads to the idea of conservation of energy within a closed system. So classical mechanics is used to calculate the behavior and stresses and movements and displacements of large objects, everything that we can see in our microscopic universe and world with all within classical mechanics. It's also the branch of physics that's used for, for aerodynamics and space travel. We use classical mechanics to observe, predict, and describe the orbit of planets, the moon, and the stars. It's what allows us to send out satellites and missions to the moon. A very interesting and very famous problem within classical mechanics is the three-body problem. So using classical mechanics, we can calculate the orbit of stars and bodies. So calculating the steady state of two orbiting bodies is very straightforward and it's a very simple analysis or problem that you can work out on your own. But once you introduce a third body to the problem, it becomes nearly impossible due to its complexity of three interacting bodies all pulling on each other to arrive at an analytic solution using partial differential equations. So in short, we can't have a good answer or predict very accurately or easily the behavior of three bodies orbiting interacting with each other through gravity. So it's one of those famous problems that for a very long time hasn't had a solution. There are workarounds or possible solutions numerically, but those are very difficult. So the main challenge of the three-body problem is the amount of calculations. If you wanted to solve it, you would 
literally need an army of people willing to do calculations over and over and over again for a very large amount of time. Uh, that's why the only viable solution or approximation to a solution is a numerical solution where you do brute force calculations. You basically use computers to do a very, very high number of calculations with a very small time step. And you're understanding that you will even still, you will probably still have some error that will propagate over time. The issue is that when you change the position of one of the three bodies, all related gravitational forces need to be updated. So it ends up being an extremely tedious calculation where you have to divide each second of time into thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of time steps, resulting in a very difficult, long mathematical calculation that is very repetitive. All right, that's all the filming today because if I film too much, the words get jumbled up in my brain. I don't say them no good. Okay, so far we've talked about what is physics, why we use mathematics and classical mechanics. So now we will be moving on to electromagnetic wave theory. Electromagnetic wave theory covers anything to do with radiation, light, and magnetism. So think optical fiber, radio waves, telecommunication, circuits, electronics, alternating engines, electricity, induction, and also the way that we generate electricity. All that falls within the field of electromagnetic wave theory. It studies the flow of energy through the universe, and we call it a wave theory because it's a coupled oscillation. So by a coupled oscillation, I mean it's a traveling wave of, made of one part a magnetic field and the second part an electric field. And both of these fields are oscillating as they travel. Electromagnetic waves travel through space and air at the speed of light, which is c times t 10 to the 8th meters per second. So pretty fast. Eight, sec eight minutes from um, the sun to the earth. But electromagnetic waves can travel through a, a variety of mediums. Different gases, glasses, anything transparent. In each medium, it will have a different constant n that relates to the density and the speed at which light travels through it. Radiation contains energy, and that is represented in its amplitude and its frequency. And we can have a variety of frequencies that constitutes the, the spectrum of light, or the spectrum of radiation. A subset of this is the visible spectrum of light, and that's the light that uh, human eyes are adapted to perceive. James Maxwell was a Scottish mathematician and physicist. He is considered the father of electrical engineering because of his pioneering work that led to the development of electromagnetic wave theory and consequently electric electrical engineering. His work led to the creation of modern circuits, transistors, resistors, and circuit boards. Our world of modern electronics wouldn't be possible without his contributions to the field. Though even though in this section I'm only really mentioning one main scientific contributor or like one founding person that contributed most to the field, there was a lot of people involved, and especially during the time that Maxwell was alive. It was a time of very rapid development with a lot of big names, such as Einstein and Madame Curie, were all alive and working at a time, and their contributions led to a period of very rapid development in science and technology. This is post-industrial ages, so think late 1800s or and early 1900s. And like I said, Maxwell kind of is like the founding scientist of the field. His main contributions are enshrined in what we call Maxwell field equations, which will be showing up right here somewhere. They are a bit of an eyesore, but they guide different behaviors and different ways that we account for magnetic fields, electric fields, how magnetic fields can generate a current in the conductor. Um, so they're extremely useful. Okay, but we're not going to go into the math. Um, a couple of other major concepts in electromagnetic wave theory are, first of all, induction. So induction is described by Lenz's law. Lenz's law describes how a changing magnetic field will lead to creating a current in the conductor. Kind of analogous to uh, Newton's third law, which says for every action there's an equal, equal and opposite reaction. So anytime there's a change in a magnetic field, there's a corresponding change opposing it represented as a current. So that's actually the key for modern electricity generation. Basically, you strap a magnet on something real big and move it. You have conductors around it over time that generates electricity. So most waves of most ways that we, we rely on that we to generate electricity rely on harnessing some form of mechanical energy. So wind moves the turbines, which are big magnets. 
uh, hydroelectricity moves big magnets as the water falls, harnessing, um, harnessing its gravitational energy as it falls. Uh, nuclear energy relies on boiling steam, which then move turbines, which are attached to magnets. Fossil fuels, same thing. You burn something, and you're able to extract mechanical energy that you attach to turbines. A generating motion and the changing magnetic field and conductors generates a current. And that's how we make electricity. So that I can think of now, solar would be the one that's different. That depends on applying a... Solar energy relies on applying an electric field across a semiconductor. Okay, so we can have a changing magnetic field, we can generate a current. You can also inverse that behavior to create electromagnets, which is what you need for electrical engines, such as electrical cars like Tesla. By applying an electric current to a conductor, that flow of electrons will align and spin and generate a magnetic field. So you can create current through a changing magnetic field, or you can create a magnetic field through a changing current, or a current flow, I should say. Another big part, another big aspect in electromagnetic wave theory is Coulomb interaction, named after French physicist Charles Augustine de Coulomb. I'm sure I'm butchering that pronunciation. <laughs> and Coulomb was the first scientist to describe this interaction between charged particles. So what's Coulomb, Coulomb interaction? Basically, if you have charged particles, they're going to interact with each other. And I'm sure everybody's heard of this next part coming up. Equals repulse, opposites attracts. And that's what governs the movement of charged particles, so that would involve basically anything involving current, as electrons move through copper conductors to, to deliver power to all the devices that we use in modern life. Interesting note, um, there's a lot of parallels between electric fields, magnetic fields, and more interestingly, gravitational fields. I say that that's interesting because gravity is one of the most mysterious, it's, it is the most mysterious force in the universe, of the four fundamental forces. Uh, we don't know very much about it, and there's some interesting parallels, like for example, the mathematics are symmetric, they both decay uh, with 1 over r squared, but interestingly, gravitational fields are monopoles. Gravitational bodies will only ever attract, they'll never repulse, because as far as we know, there's nothing that we can call negative mass. There's no gravitational interaction that will lead to two bodies repulsing, but we don't really know much about gravity, so... Maybe somebody in the future will see this video and laugh at our puny knowledge of gravity. Okay, so those are the main ideas and the biggest name in electromagnetic wave theory. So now moving on to the next two and the last two uh, fields of physics that we'll be talking about in this video. Interesting note for the next two ones is that, the f that when we talk about le electromagnetic wave theory or classical mechanics, we're talking about things that we're used to seeing and interacting with. We know that a rock will fall. You also know that if you flip a light switch, the light will come on. If you stick a fork into a socket, don't do that. There are behaviors that we have a sense of intuition. So if you get a math problem with a cannonball firing, you know that's going to be attracted to the Earth due to gravity. When we talk about quantum and relativity, because, because the realms in which they operate are not realms that humans have a sense of intuition of, because we don't interact with those forces and behaviors. So quantum relates to subatomic particles. As humans, we don't interact with anything that small. We can't. Relativity re uh, relates to things that are traveling very fast. So we don't really have a sense of intuition when it comes to quantum tunneling or tunneling. And, and here's where you'll hear a lot about very fancy... Uh, almost magical behaviors, um, such as uh, time dilation, like we mentioned, or anything quantum in Hollywood, for example. Uh, and you get very interesting thought experiments when you take, for example, quantum phenomenon and then extrapolate it to macroscopic phenomenon. And it makes for good articles and clickbait. Okay, so moving on to the next part, quantum mechanics. Okay, before going into this part a little too much, I am going to point out a little pet peeve of mine. I figure it's my video. I can I should be able to do that. Um, the way Hollywood uses quantum mechanics in movies, and I think you probably see this in video games, but not as much. Anytime you hear quantum in movies, basically assume that it means magic. This thing is this thing can do that because the plot needs to happen. Not that movies require scientific accuracy. It's not like I would enjoy a Godzilla movie more if it got their civil engineering done better. 
But Hollywood has a lot of money, and it can't be that hard to hire a science nerd or a scientist and just be like, hey, can you make this sound better? So I'm just saying, Hollywood, just stop using quantum for everything. There's other more imaginative, more imaginative scientific terms you can throw in. And like, not everything has to be quantum. Also, I've seen the trend of people mixing quantum and philosophy. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Just be careful when people use quantum phenomenon experiments to justify philosophical point of views because that's not really so much a reflection of quantum as much as a reflection of the person making the argument or the person presenting like a philosophical point of view. So quantum focuses on the physics of the very small. So think electrons orbiting a, a nuclei. An electron orbiting a nuclei is what we call a particle in a box, by the way. But quantum doesn't really happen on the macro scale. So past your electronics, we don't really have a sense of intuition of it. We don't see it. We don't interact with the quantum world. Okay, one of the biggest differences between quantum mechanics, ENM, and classical mechanics is that ENM and classical mechanics are deterministic. Quantum is probabilistic. Probabilistic. Prob probabilistic. Fuck. I'm just going to put the word here. That word. Quantum is probabilistic. Prob it depends on probabilities. So when we see something deterministic, when you think about it on the macro scale, if I tell you that chair is there, you have a clear understanding that this object is in this definitive space and it starts and ends here. When we move to a, to dealing with wave functions and probability, it, things get fuzzy. So when we talk about where does an electron exist orbiting a nuclei, we don't talk about a location. Rather, we talk about an electron cloud, which is the probability distribution in space in which that electron might exist. So in quantum, everything's statistics and probabilities. Something interesting is seeing how electrons orbit a nuclei and how that changes with energy levels. So in quantum, we have discrete energy levels, so n1, n2, n3, which are the allowed energy states. Another defining factor of quantum is uh, the mathematics are discrete, which means that things can exist at specific levels, but not in between. We won't say that time is discrete, we'll say that time is continuous because you can have infinitely smaller units of time. You can always talk about a smaller fraction of a second. Um, in quantum, you don't get that. You can't be in energy level 1.5. An electron around nuclei is only in level 1 or 2, but never anything in between. So it's discrete. So we say quantum is discrete and probabilistic. Another fundamental concept is the wave function. Wave function is a statistical distribution of energy or location. The first concept anybody that takes quantum mechanics learns is called Schrodinger's equation, named after Erwin Schrodinger. Okay, the mathematics is kind of advanced here, so I'm not going to go too much into it. Just point out a couple interesting points about this equation. So the main concept of this equation is that it relates a double space derivative to the derivative with respect to time. So basically we're matching a change of space or an acceleration to a change in time. So basically it relates to a particle's location changing along an axis as a function of time. Interesting thing to note here is the usage of i, which is the square root of negative one or an imaginary number. This is used to represent the phase and angle of a wave function. If it's squared, it becomes a negative one. So basically you're changing your entire value to a negative. And this can be useful for some of the math done in quantum. Another fundamental concept in quantum is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Yeah, I'm sure everybody's heard the name Heisenberg from Breaking Bad. So Heisenberg uncertainty principle basically states that the more you know about a particles or a system's energy, the less you will know about its location. So basically implying that there's a maximum amount of data that you can collect. And this is kind of due to that fuzziness that I mentioned about quantum mechanics. The more you find out about a particle's energy level, the less you'll be able to find out about its location, and vice versa. Okay, moving on to just a general couple of quick ideas in quantum that are fundamental. First is quantum tunneling. Quantum tunneling is the concept that when a particle is traveling with speed and it collides with a barrier, there's a chance it will go through, basically like teleport through, so penetrate. So that's called quantum tunneling. If you think of it in macroscopic scale, think of, of if you throw a tennis ball at a wall, there's a chance the tennis ball will travel through the wall, there's a chance it will bounce back. So in quantum, this is generally used to represent a flow of electrons hitting a barrier in a circuit, and there's a chance that some of the electrons are going to break through the barrier and that's going to lead to current leakage. 
and the more energy a particle has, the greater of a possibility of it penetrating a barrier. The thicker the barrier, the more energy it takes to break through. Another big experiment in quantum that I've seen mentioned a lot outside of quantum is a double slit experiment. Now there's a lot going on here and we're not going to have time to cover it at all, but basically it's the, it's the experiment that proves the dual nature of an electron as a wave and a particle. So basically the general idea is that if you have say a barrier with two slits in it and you shoot an electron at it, you'd expect the electron to behave like a particle and go through one slit or the other and then reaching a sensor behind the slit. So you would expect to see a distribution across the sensor relating to where it could possibly land. But what we find experimentally is that it behaves more like a wave of light. If you shoot in a single electron through a double slit, it will act as if it went through both slits and then interfere with itself on the other side, creating what we call an interference pattern of light. Light has a unique property that you can add it to itself. So a beam of light plus a beam of light can equal a brighter beam of light or cancel itself out and lead to darkness. So on the sensor on the receiving end of the electron, it behaves like a wave of light as if it gone through both slits and then as if it been a wave of light interacting with itself. So kind of like what I talked about in an earlier video regarding the chip shortage is the decreasing size of lithography used for chip manufacture. In semiconductors, in chip manufacturing, there's what's called Moore's Law. It basically it states that we're able to double the density of transistors that go into computer chips every two years. And Moore's Law was put forth by one of the founding members of Intel. The issue is that currently we are, depending on who you ask and how you measure, we are between 4 and 10 nanometers um, across different companies and product lines. The issue here is that these structures are starting to get down to the atomic level. So at 4 nanometers, you're looking at tens of atomic layers so the barrier is getting small enough that now there's able to be quantum behavior through these barriers so basically quantum behavior is becoming more important in the design and the behavior of chips there's a lot of speculation that at some point chips uh chip design might hit a wall or slow down once as as these quantum behaviors become more prominent because it will just take a lot of re-engineering of how the structures and interconnections are set up because of current leakage. In response to this, government, academia, and the industry have started putting resources into researching quantum computing. It's a completely different architecture for how you make a computer chip and how you process logic. There's also spintronics. Current flow is an electron traveling. Spintronics is a traveling perturbation. So you have a series of atoms with a spin alignment and then spintronics is communication or data processing by oscillating the spin field of electrons, creating traveling perturbations. But this is a whole other can of worms and there's a lot to study here. So for quantum, we got wave functions, probability distributions, electron clouds, Schrodinger's equation, and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, the double slit experiment as well. This is just a quick survey. You could spend a lifetime studying any one of these things. All right, and moving on to the last part of our tour of physics, relativity. Very famous, uh, I think, I think you could say it's the most recent or like the most recently developed kind of entering the mainstream in 1940s and 1950s, famously pioneered by none other than Albert Einstein. So the first big concept in relativity is E equals MC squared. Although there's a little bit more to the equation, as shown here, there's the relativistic portion, um, but E equals MC squared rolls off the tongue a bit easier. The main concept between behind this equation, the mass energy equivalency is that it equates energy with mass, C, which is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So C squared is nine times 10 to the 16th meters squared per second squared. Very large number. So one unit of mass is multiplied by 9 times 10 to the 18th to get your unit of energy out. Meaning that a very small amount of mass converted to energy leads to a very large amount of energy being dispelled. And that's the main principle behind nuclear physics. We're basically harnessing energy from breaking down nuclei and converting a little bit of mass to energy. Also why nuclear bombs go big boom. This phenomenon of converting mass to energy is what powers the sun and all the stars. 
Relativity is broken down into two different parts, special relativity and general relativity. So first, general relativity. Special relativity postulates that the speed of light is the same in all inertial frames of reference. The key word here is inertial, which refers to motion. The key idea here is that there will be some change in some behaviors the faster you travel. That's where you get space and time dilation. Speed of light is the same in all reference frames, which means that regardless of who measures at what speed light is traveling at, it will always be C if it's in vacuum. If you have two agents traveling at different speeds and they both measure the same beam of light, they will both measure C, three times 10 to the eighth, regardless of how fast they're traveling. If they're traveling differently and they measure the same speed, something has to give so that, uh, but something, something has to give for them to get the same measurement. For C to be the same for both parties, space and time will dilate or accelerate to accommodate. So basically, the faster you go approaching the speed of light, the more space dilation and the more time dilation you get. If you wanted to live forever, you would try to travel at the speed of light because then time is barely passing for you, but passing much faster for the rest of the universe. Uh, you can't get to the speed of light, by the way. Not with our current technologies, anyway. Just in case. So light's the same speed in all inertial frames of reference is special relativity. General relativity is the more groundbreaking and exotic one um, that Albert Einstein formulated. Basically, what general relativity tells us is that mass has the ability to curve space-time. It also changes how someone would feel the passage of time under a gravitational field. That's why in the movie Inter Interstellar, you have a plot point, the crew going down to a planet with a very high gravitational field, and thus time passed very differently for the people in the gravitational field as for people outside because of the relativistic time distortion. This also explains uh, the orbit of planets. Planets are massive enough to significantly curve space-time around them. That makes it possible for another body with kinetic energy to get trapped in its gravitational well, meaning that it will enter an orbit around the larger body. The orbiting body it will appear in its own frame of reference traveling straight but outside of that frame of reference, it's traveling in an orbit of curved space around the planet due to the mass of the planet. And that's why the moon orbits the Earth and the Earth orbits the sun. Um, that's why if a body escapes the orbit of the Earth, it falls into the sun's gravity well because it's so much larger and it covers the entire solar system. A famous thought experiment relating to relativity is the um, there's an astronaut in space, there's an astronaut on Earth, they're twins, how does time pass differently? They actually did do this experiment where one twin went for an extended stay in the International Space Station and the other twin stay on Earth to study their biological differences over time. Basically, the faster you go, the more time dilation you feel, the slower time passes for you in your frame of reference, and the faster time will pass for the rest of the universe. At the moment, uh, the speed of light is so fast that we don't have any means to practically accelerate anything bigger than a particle to the speed of light. And accelerating a particle to even close to a fraction of the speed of light can only be done in specialized particle accelerators like CERN. And those involve massive underground tunnels where a particle is continually accelerated by a continual chain of well-placed electromagnets that power on and give the particle a magnetic push over and over again until the particle is traveling close to the speed of light. And that's how you can have particles colliding with each other at very high speeds. All right, well, to anybody that made it through, thank you very much for watching. That covers this quick little survey on physics. What is it? Why we use mathematics? And then four of the main branches of physics, classical mechanics, ENM, quantum relativity. This is all part of our global human heritage, and it has contributions of thinkers, scientists, teachers, and engineers, and regular people cumulative over the five, 700 years of human civilization. And... Physics, science, and technology is the reason why our species is now a solar species, because we have we have sensors, satellites, and rovers on most of our nearby planets, even out to the edges of our solar system. We have multiple rovers on Mars, uh, satellites around Mars and Mars moons, around our moon, Voyager, out in the far reaches of the solar system. And all this is possible through the work of so many people that dedicate their lives to documenting, pushing forward science, and then passing it down to the next generation. As much as we know, we're learning how little we know. Um, dark energy and dark mass give us a very 
good idea and keep us humble in our knowledge. There is still so much to learn. We have no insight and very little understanding of the majority of the energy and the mass in the universe. Why is the, why is the universe expanding? We don't know. What's dark mass? We don't know. Why did entropy reverse itself at the Big Bang? We don't know. So to anybody interested in science, there's plenty of questions out there for anybody wanting to seek them out. Thank you very much for watching. Please like and subscribe if you like this type of content. If you have any questions or feedback, please put it in the comments. Later. Take care. And thank you.